Good evening. Uh, I'm Paul Webley. I'm the Director and Principal of SOAS. It's a very real pleasure to welcome SOAS alumni and friends, and also those people who haven't visited SOAS before for this special book launch event. It's really great to see so many of you here this evening. Now, you'll be glad to know that I'm not going to give a long welcome speech. You're not here to listen to me, but you enjoy the conversation between uh, Fatima and Michael and ask her some questions yourselves. But I do just want to say two things. One to the alumni, and I know because I've checked that most of the audience are actually alumni, but also to people who've not been to SOAS before. So just for, first to the alumni. Our alumni relations program at SOAS has grown significantly over the past couple of years. We now have 40,000 alums spread over 180 countries, with more than 12,000 based here in London. We've devised an exciting events for our alumni, such as this event this evening, We've just published a new magazine, which I hope you've seen. Uh, we've completed our first ever telephone fundraising campaign, which has raised more than £26,000 from our alumni here in the UK. I should tell you that I went to visit this for a couple of evenings, and I have to say I found it really inspiring to hear the conversations from alums about how being at SIAS had been a transformational experience for them. It was really very, very interesting. And that money will be going towards scholarships, hardship grants, the Library Transformation Project, and various student projects. Last week, I attended an alumni event in Washington, D.C., and I met one student who graduated from SOAS in 1971, and some who graduated a couple of years ago, and most of the years in between were also represented. But despite that almost 40-year span of graduation dates, they all shared something. And it wasn't just recollections of the distinctive scent that used to emerge from the SOAS bar, though that does seem to play a part in the memories of many, many alumni, I have to say. What they talked about could be summed up in the phrase, a great sense of community. That's what came across. At SOAS, we have a common set of values, a common purpose. Not that that stops us arguing all the time. We are, after all, a university, and that's what universities are about. So it's great to see you here again reconnecting as part of the wider SOAS community. For the small minority of you who are newcomers, if this is your first visit to SOAS, please don't let it be your last. SOAS offers a wide range of lectures, concerts, exhibitions, and other events. There's always something going on. There's something of interest to everyone. Do look at our web pages to see what exhibition is on in the Brunei Gallery, or what is coming up in the SOAS concert series, or what lectures or panel discussions we're hosting. I, I'm biased, of course, but I do think SOAS has the most interesting range of events uh, in London. And if you've got your time free, you could spend every evening here, actually every day here, doing something interesting. And this evening's event is particularly special. Uh, Fatima is one of our esteemed alumni. It's wonderful that you're here. Uh, it's a pleasure to have her here this evening. Her new book has been widely publicised in the media. It's been reviewed in many publications. Uh, and Fatima has been a great ambassador for SAIS. She was just telling me in the green room, I love this. She said, um, when, before she came to SAIS, she had an offer uh, from Oxford. Did you have an offer from somewhere else as well? LSE. LSE. Well, I went to LSE, another great place, not quite as good as SAIS. <laughs> An offer from LSE and Oxford, and then she decided to come to SOAS, and apparently they, the people at Oxford were a bit surprised by this decision, whereas actually, from my point of view, it makes every good sense. But also, it's one of the things that makes us such a good ambassador for SOAS, so thanks very much. We're really pleased to have the opportunity to host you here tonight. Now, before we hear from uh, Fatima, I'd just like to introduce you to the chair of tonight's talk, and then I'm going to disappear down into the audience somewhere so I can just listen. Uh, Michael Redford, an Oscar-nominated director and screenwriter, Born under the British Raj in New Delhi, Michael is well-travelled in India and Pakistan. His films are of a political and historical nature. I believe I've been told that you're due to commence shooting your second Shakespeare collaboration. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. That's right. yeah, which, yeah which, absolutely. Which, which sounds great. It, we wish you luck for that. Thank it's you. It's a real pleasure to have Michael with here, us with here, and to chair this event. We're very grateful for that. Um, we hope that Michael stays in touch with SOAS after the event, though you did tell me that you'd been here before. I have. So you're not actually a newcomer. You've been in this lecture theatre. I've been in this lecture theatre. I so, sat over there. Actually. So, Michael, <laughs> over to you to kick off the event. I'm going to just go and enjoy it like everyone else. So, okay, over great. to you. All right. <laughs> I don't... Uh, oh, this is exciting. I've got wires <laughs> dripping from every corner of my body. Um, I don't know quite what chairing 
uh, this meeting is all about. I thought it was making a speech, but um, it's clearly not. Uh, and I'm going to have a, so I'm going to have a conversation with Fatty. I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, there was a slight rumour going about the place that I'd been invited to do this because I was going to be kind and nice. I don't do kind and nice, and Fatty knows that very well. Um, she is a friend, but um, I'm going to be as hard on her as I possibly can because. I know it's going to provoke her, as hard, as hard on her as she would be with me if I were in her position. Um, so I don't know how many people in here have actually read um, Song of Blood and Sword. Uh, could, we, could I have a show of hands of people who've actually read it? Um, oh, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a whole bunch of people out there who are going to go and buy it. So. Yes. Um, uh, the reason I say that is because I don't want to uh, kind of assume things that... that um, that other people uh, might not know. Um, it's a very controversial book. Um, it's controversial for a number of reasons. Um, it's controversial because it puts, um, it's a very personal and, uh, memoir, I think, and it puts very firmly uh, the blame fair and square for um, Fatih's father's murder um, on the president of Pakistan today. Um, it's also controversial, I think, for another reason, and this is something that I'm, I think a, a number of critics have picked up on. Yeah. Um, it's controversial because it's a strange and rather original mixture of personal memoir, deeply felt, um, and a historical background, a sort of, um, if you like, a book about the history and the failures of Pakistan um, and the events that led up to the murder of her father. Now, those two things don't sit so easily together, and this is what I'm going to ask her about, because um, at, at, you can, at, at, at times she's been, the book has been called superficial, and at times it's been called dazzling. Um, and it's a sort of mixture of the two. Uh, it's immensely felt. Um, it's as though... I don't know. I mean, if I can say this, Fatih, uh, without meaning to be, in any way to be... If it's, like, it's as though one of the Borgias had sat down oh, yeah. and written a book about their family <coughs> from the point of view of growing up in that family. And inevitably, that is contentious and controversial because it's mm. from an insider's point of view. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are you calling me a black sheep Borgia now? No, 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 not at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did I mention the word black sheep? Oh, well, uh, I, I, I'd like I'll to stop it talking there. anyway. I'll stop talking because <laughs> there are many things that... But, uh, and the other, th the other thing is that it's a fascinating insight <coughs> because it's, it's deeply felt. It is deeply, deeply moving at certain moments. How do you, how do well, you deal with all that? Well, it is both those things. It is a personal memoir and it, it, and it is a political take on Pakistan. Um, because I, I never wanted it to be only one of those things. Um, I didn't want it to be one of those dry books that, that you have to read for re research purposes, but that you, you close, put back on a shelf, and it doesn't change the way you look at a country or, or at a people. Um, and I didn't want it to be a sort of collection of, you know, my thoughts, you know, my sort of <laughs> diary, as it were. Um, I just did um, the Soaz radio before this talk, and it was when I was at Soaz that I started the process of researching the book. And my SOAS dissertation was on resistance to Zia haqs military regime in the 70s and 80s in Pakistan. I needed that research. I needed that research because the people who could have told me about that period were gone. They were dead. Um, and I found, when I was sitting in the library, and those of you who go to school here know that SOAS library is amazing. It's the vastest sort of um, treasure trove possible. But I found very little. Um, I found I had to go out and speak to people. I had to go online. I had to go into libraries. I had to go into archive material. And that shaped how I did the rest of the book. I think, to talk about the responses to the book, you know, I heard Philip Pullman speak at your alma mater at Oxford recently. And he said that writing is a despotic exercise. It's tyrannical, which is so true, because you're sitting there and you have control over what you'd like to focus on or what your voice will be. But reading is a democratic one. So I hope people are able to go through the book and take both those factors out of it. So they're able to take the insider's eyewitness personal view of a family, um, a family built on a, a mythology 
in many ways, certainly in Pakistan. Um, and also see that it is a researched book, that there are you know, pages of footnotes at the back that you can go and follow up on if you want to double check or if you want to reconfirm or if you want to read more. The thing that, 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 that slightly bemused me, I have to say, mm. um, is that when you talk about, for instance, your grandfather, mm -hmm. you, you have a great sort of insight into how he thought and felt because mm. he's part of your family. Mm. When you talk about Zia al mm -hmm. you give yourself the liberty to say he felt this. <coughs> But I would, in just okay. there, mm. I would have preferred to have just seen the facts, Dan. And I'm, I, I don't mean that I want a dry mm. piece, but I, I'd rather see the facts and then draw my own conclusions. Well, the bit with Zia, I mean, Zia is a ghost that followed my family from my, before my birth, really, throughout my childhood. Um, and Zia and his feelings were gleaned from... We can blame Soaz, because that's where I did the Zia research. But that was all archive material. And it was interviews that I did with journalists who at the time were writing under Zia. And, and for those who know, um, the most extreme censorship was imposed on, on the media in Pakistan then. Um, you had journalists flogged on the, on the road during Zia's time. Um, it was done with interviews you know, with human rights uh, campaigners or with political activists who were jailed for years under Zia. So I suppose that if, if there were liberties that I took, it, it was from people, I hope, who, who did live, um, who lived through the violence of the Zia regime. Um, but I'm wondering, where did I say he feels something? Um, I could cite you the page, yes, but we'd yes. probably spend 45 minutes looking let's, for it. Let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Let's get academic. But um, it wasn't my intention. I think that Zia... If, if there is a personal take on Zia, it is because Zia was like a, a member of, of that world that I grew up in. You know, I grew up, I was born three years after my grandfather Zulfikar was killed. Um, and he was killed by Zia. Um, you know, Zia was once asked why he made the decision to kill Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, and he said it was two men in one coffin. And that, well, he wasn't going to be the one sitting in the coffin. And he was, a, he was a twin ghost at that time in our life. You know, we lived outside the country because of Zia. We lost family members because of Zia. You know, the people I grew up seeing in, in the living room and at my parents' dinners were people who had been tortured under Zia. So I suppose there is, there is a personal side of Zia that maybe was difficult to separate. Mm -hmm. you, you give a very... You give a very um I don't know how to, how to explain it. You give a very, very vivid mm -hmm. picture of the chaos mm. that is Pakistan, mm. the enduring chaos of this place. Yeah. And, and um, I just want to know why. It's the question that, that, that to, to me, um, I absolutely... I don't know why should it be. Why should it be that this country, which mm. is so rich in culture mm. and in... And in and in law, and has such a, 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 mm -hmm. a vivid people, yes. should, be, should live in such chaos? Um, well, I'll be really so asy and say that when we talk about the chaos that is Pakistan, and if we want to extend it and talk about the region and the subcontinent, why is it that we have these countries with legacies of violence, of state violence? And why is it that we have this group of, of countries not just with a legacy of state violence, a legacy of silence after the violence, a legacy of dynasty, a legacy of political assassinations, and assassinations that happen every day, I mean, of journalists and activists. I think we've got to go back to the Raj. I think we have to look at, at, at a, a part of the world um, born fractured after the, the push for, for independence. I mean, one of the great cleavages that the British left us <coughs> not you guys, you're, you're all right, but the, <coughs> the other British... <coughs> I'm not. ...was, yeah, <laughs> was... Um, well, the one thing they did better than anything, really, was, was to divide and rule, was to limit the field um, of politics, was to turn it into an exclusive arena. Um, so it's no surprise that we all, whether it's Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, um, Nepal, suffer a lot of these same tremors 
Um, I think it's part of the colonial experience. I won't even say post, really. That's just one of the things I learned at SOAS. Um, but it continues today. It continues to the fact that this is a country yesterday, on the 19th of May, the Pakistani government banned Facebook. Um, today, on the 20th of May, they've banned YouTube and Wikipedia. And the, the ostensible reason for this ban, according to the government, is that un-Islamic un -Islamic features were found on these websites. Um, if you have a problem with Facebook, close your account. You don't limit access to millions of people. Um, if you want to protest um, the, the fight against Islam, how about you stop letting American drones fly overhead and kill your people? Um, and this happens, and there's no noise. I've been sitting here in England, and I don't hear any noise about this censorship. I don't hear anyone saying this is unacceptable for a so-called democratic country to do. Rather, you've got governments in Pakistan that are propped up still uh, by the very foreign powers that we, we fought to throw out of our country, not just Britain, but the United States too. And do you think that, that I mean, I've, I've often heard, because India, chaotic and violent and mm. corrupt as mm. it is, has somehow managed to stabilize itself to the point where it can move forwards. Um, and I once asked um, um, somebody from Pakistan what they thought mm. the reason was that Pakistan found, it in, found themselves incapable of doing this. And the answer was the zamindari. Mm -hmm. and, it, and some people have said that, that the most important thing that Nehru ever did mm -hmm. was to abolish, even though it caused huge problems in mm. 19... Uh, I think 1948, mm -hmm. um, was to abolish the Zamindari. And if you don't know what Zamindari are, um, pa yes. Patty will explain I, it to you. <laughs> I will be the representative. Um, so that's feudalism, basically. And certainly, it was incredibly important for India to abolish feudalism. That said, um, there is not just feudalism. There's, there's industrial oligarchy. If we look at India today, if we look at Chhattisgarh and, and the Maoists fighting in that region, they're fighting against enormously large corporations backed by Indian billions coming to take over forest land, coming to mine mines. Um, so I think it's not enough just to end feudalism. Certainly, it should be ended. But then the stranglehold has to be broken on industrial um, <laughs> zamindari too. Um, and, and neither country has, I mean, certainly India has not done that. Um, Pakistan did have moments of flirting with land reform. Um, the last land reforms done were done under my grandfather. And at that time, they were the most comprehensive that had been done. A second phase was planned for 1977 that would reduce the private land holdings to um, 100 acres and 150 acres for irrigated and non-irrigated land. Um, that never went through. What we've seen since then, rather, is in fact under his daughter, Maya Benazir, the, the ceiling on private land holdings was removed. Um, you know, they say about Pakistan that at the time of partition, 21 families controlled the wealth of the country, and now the number is 27. Um, there is no move at the moment to eradicate feudalism. There is no move to bust uh, monopolies on industry. Um, and there is no push to do so. I hope one of the, you know, I said a black sheep borgia because it, it's sort of inconvenient to be talking about the ills of feudalism when you come from a large feudal family. Um, it's, it's not done. It's one of the things we don't talk about in Pakistan. Um, it's one of the things that always is used to explain our state. Um, I, I would go so far as to say it's, it's one of the many. But also, if we can go back to why it is that Pakistan hasn't run the course of India. I would say, and as you said, India is chaotic and as corrupt, and, as, and certainly there is, a, you know, there is a civil war happening in India at the moment. We see a similar situation in Pakistan. There is, an, there is an elite in Pakistan that is quite like the shining Indian elite, that has access to enormous wealth, to enormous business, to world markets. Um, but like with India, it's a very small minority. So, um, let's, let, okay, I understand that. And also, I mean, why is it, that, do you think, and this is obviously something that you're 
-hmm. your grandfather, mm -hmm. as, you, as, you, as you say in the book, fought against. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that Pakistan was so susceptible um, to the West, to Western influence in the way that it, al it almost became a fiefdom of the CIA, yeah. for yes. probably still is still. to a degree. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's, the, that's the question, isn't it? Um, I remember your, your grandfather um, when he made his, his yeah. overtures to China. And I remember yeah. uh, he always had this kind of rather raffish feel about him. I, I, I kind of <laughs> liked him. His hair was always sticking all <laughs> yes. over the place. Yeah. And, um, and I remember, you know, we, you know yeah. we thought that this was beyond the pale that he would do something like this. Yeah. And, you know, we were all wondering what was going to happen to the... To the we felt, and everybody we felt, know. that the world yeah. was going to explode if Pakistan and China made an alliance. Yes. Well, certainly it's something that, that still worries people very much. Um, I, I don't think China's terribly pushed anymore about having that same relationship with Pakistan yeah. that we are still obsessed with. But why is it that, that America especially had the control it did? You know, it starts very early. And I think we have to look at military rule. I think when you have an army that is the state, um, and it's a many, it's 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 a many-headed hydra, isn't it? Um, the army in Pakistan, for those of you who don't know, they're not just in charge of our defence. Uh, they're not just in charge of politics. The army owns property. It makes cereal. It makes cement. They have banks. They have water. You know, this was the machinery that needed a lot of um, funds, and. You know, it's, it's really by the 1960s, you know, less than 20 years after partition, Pakistan is firmly allied with Uncle Sam. In fact, the name for imperialism in Urdu, and those of you who speak Urdu will know this, the name we have for imperialism in Pakistan is Samraj, and that's the Raj of Uncle Sam. I mean, it's in, it's in our lexicon. <laughs> this, is, this is how we understand imperialism in Pakistan. And the Pakistani people, are, on one hand, um, very much want that to end. I mean, that's, that's without a doubt. Uh, the Pakistani government exists as it does because of the support of the United States. And when America is funding, let's say, the army or the political establishment in Pakistan in the billions of dollars, how do we break through that? How do nascent political movements or you know, political parties or activist groups compete with two parties and a military that have received billions of dollars? They can't. Um, so it's become a it's become a self-perpetuating, self-funding cycle. Um. You know, you know, one of the things that comes. I mean, as you say that, I, I'm just thinking that one of the things that kind of comes through in your book is is mm. is, in a way, the lives that you, um, your your father and your uncle mm. led, and to a certain extent, Benazir too, mm -hmm. and your and your grandfather, mm -hmm. is a, a, a lives of sort of impotence in a way there's a sort of if anybody yeah. wants to do anything mm. you, they have to go abroad and then sit there and do, do you know what I mean <laughs> the, the, yeah. I mean particularly your father and his brother there yeah. seemed a sort of an impotence about it um, yeah I, I mean I think I think that's also due to the fact that when you ref, when you refuse to play ball with the establishment which is a military establishment in Pakistan um, you are edged out. Um, and and part, part of why Benazir survived for as long as she did, and I think why she was as heralded as she was in the West, was because she understood the importance of playing ball. Um, you know, there's, and I mentioned this in the book, and it, you know, this is part of the lore, really, in Pakistan, and it's part of the mythology built up. But Henry Kissinger is meant to have said to Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, if you go ahead with these plans, to build the nuclear bomb, we will make a horrible example out of you. And Zulfikar Ali Bhutto went ahead with the plans and a, an example was made out of him. It, 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 determines, it determines Pakistani politics, this reach of the army and America. When just months ago, the Americans decided to push forward this horrendous Kerry Luger bill, um, which is a bill that will give $7.5 billion, $7 billion to Pakistan in five years in development money. Um, and it's development money that, by the way, goes towards you know, funds set up by the president, as it turns out, surprisingly. And it's, and it's a bill that it, we will give you development aid, provided you open up 
uh, access to your nuclear arsenal to us. You open up your military files to us. We have a veto power and who gets elected, elected, chosen to be head of uh, the military in Pakistan. You know, which was met, obviously, the Kerry Luga bill that was then met with a lot of protests in Pakistan. And at that point, Richard Holbrook, who is in the country more uh, than the president, really, Richard Holbrook came to Pakistan and said, anyone who is against the Kerry Luger bill is against democracy. Anyone who's against the Kerry Luger bill is against progress for Pakistan. Um, when, the, when the army, when the Pakistani army launched its war in Swat last year, if you didn't support the army, you were with the terrorists. You know, all this, of course, is very familiar. But that's what Pakistani politics is shaped by. You don't go along with the army. Good luck. What, what yeah, I mean, but I'm, I'm just thinking about what ordinary people um, mm. are, are, are kind of thinking and feeling. Mm. Um, I mean, clearly, your family have represented to mm. them um, a kind of life belt in some kind of way. Mm. Um, and there's a, a strong cult of personality in yes. all that, isn't there? Because, Very. yeah. There's, there is, you know, and, and the way I, I look at it is. This cult of personality has destroyed the political culture. It's one of the things that has destroyed the political culture of Pakistan. Because people, when they, when they are allowed to go and cast votes, um, they are voting on, on ghosts, and they are voting on, on the dead. You know, they are not voting for programs, they are not voting for platforms, on platforms, they are not voting on a manifesto. They are voting on a blood debt. And, and part of this really comes up after, I mean, after Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto was killed. There was so much hope placed in Benazir, I think, because people wanted her to succeed because she would have been a blow against that establishment. Um, and they took great risks to, to support her and to push her forward because that was dangerous business at the time. Um, and when that failed, when by 1990 that was over, you know, and no legislation had been passed, none of Zia's laws had been removed, you know, not the Hudud ordinance, not the blasphemy law. Um, Can you just were, explain to people the, what the So Hudud the Hudud ordinance, they are the most violent pieces of legislation in Pakistan today, and the Hudud ordinance says if you commit the crime of theft, you should have your, your hands cut off. Um, and no doctor in Pakistan, I mean, not till this day, they haven't found one doctor to carry out an amputation in Pakistan, which to me is an immense source of pride. I mean, that's Pakistani resistance for you when it's good. Um, and, and the Hudud Ordinance says that any woman found guilty of the crime of adultery can be put to death. Um, it says any woman who commits the sin of premarital sex can be put to death. So, in effect, it, it criminalizes the, the victim of rape. Um, the blasphemy law is a tool by which um, Christians, Hindus, any, any member of a minority can be persecuted by the state just for looking sideways at the Quran, basically. Um, None of these things were removed in the democratic two years after the junta fell. And, and when they were asked, when the Pakistani people were asked to try again, to try Bhutto again, to try the party that had failed them now again, they were told they owed them. They failed. They didn't. They owed the people. But the people were, were told that because the blood of Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, because the blood of Shah Nawaz was on their hands, they owed it. And it runs today, I mean, clearly. And what it means is that you, you have a nuclear country, and this is one of my favorite facts, you have a nuclear country that missed its millennium goals to eradicate polio. Not because we are not capable. I mean, we've got leprosy under WHO control limits since years, you know. But because the state could not guarantee the refrigeration of the vaccines. Um, when you have politicians stamping, when someone goes out on this family name, really now, um, and everyone is a Bhutto these days, so there's a, there's a good amount of them out there. When people do that, they don't say, I w we will guarantee that you have electrical supplies for your homes and your businesses, because that's ridiculous. They say, because so-and-so was killed, because such-and-such blood was spilled. And that's the basis on which they campaign. Well, I mean, one of the extraordinary things about, about, about the book is, is the way in which... Um, Obviously, Benazir is in, in every because it's, it's, she's very controversial. She's much mm -hmm. loved uh, mm -hmm. over here. Um, the way in which she turns from being from being your favourite aunt to being the person who puts her brother in jail and eventually is an accomplice mm -hmm. to his murder, yes. according to your to your book. Yes. 
which is really what the heart of the book is about. Yeah. Um, how does that happen? Power. Um, and I always say, to, to give Benazir her, her due, really, that it is the nature of the beast. I don't believe that, you know, something evil happened and overnight something was transformed or some deal was made and that, that turned her. But the aunt, the Benazir I knew, outside of power, was not just a phenomenally courageous woman, but a woman who was a passionate campaigner, who struggled, who fought for, for, for issues she believed in at the cost of her freedom, at the cost of her very young life at that point. Um, and, and, and continued to do so because these were things she believed in. Um, that doesn't change overnight. I think it is a gradual change. I think, I think, unfortunately, when she made the choice to enter into power sharing negotiations with the military in 1986, and power sharing, mind you, not to take power from the military, but to share it with the military, um, she could no longer be that passionate campaigner. She could no longer. Um, she could no longer have the freedom she had had, because now she had to abide by IMF dictates set by the army. She had to abide by the foreign policy, um, especially in India and in Kashmir and in Afghanistan, <coughs> set by the army. And compromises were made to do so. Um, I think it is power, and I don't think she's alone in it. And and I tried very much to say that in the book that. Sulfakar, who, who enters politics with an idealism for Pakistan, with an imagination for a just Pakistan and, and an independent, sovereign Pakistan, also makes mistakes, costly mistakes, for power. You know, he, he, he changes the constitution that his government brought, um, that his government was responsible for writing. He changes the constitution to secure his own hold on power. I, d I don't think it's because they're nasty people, they're evil people. I think it's because that's what power does. You know, what did, what did, what, I keep quoting Republican presidents, but what did Richard Nixon say? He said, if the president does it, it's not illegal. You know, I think, I think that's what happens when you become the president, unfortunately. Do you think it's inevitable? Or is that part of the fact that the, the Bhutto's, in a certain sense, became the royal family of Pakistan, or the, the presidential family, or the hereditary I rulers, or whatever it is? I don't, I don't think it's all due to them. I mean, I don't, certainly they're not the only people who succumb to this uh, pull of power. Um, you know, Pakistan is ruled by dynasties now, whether it's the Sharif family, the army is a dynasty of sorts, really. It's a, it's a very funny family in itself. Um, I mean, you, I would be hard-pressed to find an instance of, of, a, of a politician or a ruler or a president who <laughs> voluntarily gives up power because people have just... I mean... Um, What's his name? Oh, I always have these moments on stage where you're, you're lucid and eloquent <laughs> off stage. Give me a clue. And then um, De Gaulle. De Gaulle, didn't he? I mean, De Gaulle put forward an, um, a referendum. The people rejected and he said, all right, bye, see you later, and walked off. But how often does that happen? Um, in South Asia, never. <laughs> never. And, uh, you know, I, when I was at Suez, I... In one of my in the, my politics class, I was a Bangladeshi student, and he said to me, he said, oh, you know, Dhaka is so difficult to navigate because every time the government changes, all the names of the roads change and the bridges change and the airport changes. Is Karachi the same? And I said, no, they're all called Jinnah. <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> we're lucky that way. Um, but I, I think that's, that's, that's the trade-off, isn't it? You want to be president of a country? You want to be part of a political establishment? Well, politics is not simple. I mean, you, let's, let's just, um, before, before I throw this out, let, yeah. let's, let's, because otherwise we're not, nobody's going to have any time to ask any questions, let's, let's just talk about the personal things. I mean, in the end, yeah. um, this is, in a certain sense, this is a book written to exercise, exercise, exercise uh -huh. the, 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 um, the murder of your father. Um, do you think you've been able to do that? Well, it's still a case, you know, we've been fighting for 14 years for justice in the courts of Pakistan. And, you know, anyone who knows the courts of Pakistan know that this could go on forever. For me, more than exercising anything, it, it was about putting it down. It was about a sort of the justice of memory, I suppose. Um, 
you know, at the time that the Asif Zardari became president of Pakistan, just before he became president, he was standing trial in four murder cases, only one of which was my father's, um, but three other murder, murder trials. These are things we know in Pakistan. I mean, these are things we're not allowed to talk about. Um, but your father also was, was yes. in jail for murder. Yeah, well, he was not murder. Against. He was in jail for treason and, and oh, sedition. And, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and all sorts of um, other frightening things. And, you know, eventually the same courts that, ac that accused him of treason and sedition acquitted him. It took years. It took 25 years for those things to happen. You know, at the time when he was going through the process, every judge that, that acquitted my father was sacked. Um, those, are his, those are part of the records. I mean, that's it's a historical amazing. record. It's amazing that, that anything, anybody has the, the guts uh, or, or to, to continue to believe in justice or <coughs> believe in anything. I mean, it, but nevertheless, they do. They do. And I think what, is, what for me is phenomenal about Pakistan <coughs> is that this is a country against all odds that, that does believe it deserves better. And it does. You know, and it does... You know, if we look at people who have struggled under dictatorships from time immemorial, really, till the present day, um, these are people who still go out to... F I mean, we've ha we had something like an estimate... You know, it was estimated to be 10,000 men disappeared from the Baloch province after 9-11. And we only know that those men were disappeared. Well, we don't know because of the media, because they, they played ball and didn't talk about it. We don't know because of human rights groups in Pakistan, because they get awards from the presidency, in fact, as it happened. Um, but we knew because of the families of those men who went out with their, with their photographs, like very much like what happened in Latin America during the dirty wars. They went out with those photographs, and they were beaten, and they were jailed, and they were disappeared, but they still did it. Um, and for me, that's, that's, co that's cause for enormous hope. Um, so. But yeah, so, so this book was to write those things down, to talk about those stories that we live with every day in Pakistan. But outside of Pakistan, you know, you only know us for sort of guns, beards, and, you know, poverty. <laughs> but, and certainly there are, we do have those. But we have so much more. Um, and we have people, many people, I think, in Pakistan who talk about these issues. But as we know now, the volume is shut. YouTube is closed. You know, their, their, their modes of getting information across to each other are censored, whether it's SMS or Facebook. But they exist. I mean, I, I hope and I always say I'm, I'm one of thousands. Well, they, they, these things tend to come back to bite those. Uh, yeah. To bite the people who do them. Uh, um, just one last thing, which I'm dying to ask you, because, because <laughs> sometimes, I mean, you say that you have no political ambitions yourself. No. You have none, and none at all. She sounds like the Al Pacino in The Godfather. <laughs> you know? It's like, it's like... <laughs> it's like you know, I'm the one that's I'm the one that got away, and actually, you're the elected leader. <laughs> I mean, so I'm, I'm Michael... aren't you aren't you damned or or whatever it is? <laughs> if you do, and damned if you don't. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But um, I sort of I wonder. I mean, I'm not really Michael in exile in Sicily at this point. That's really what turns him, isn't it? But um, <laughs> but I. You know, I am very political, clearly, and I write on very political issues, and I do very political things. But um, I'm not stupid, you know, and, and anybody who's lived in the family I have, and, and who's watched power from the outside, um, you know, you don't, you don't see the glitz and the glamour. You know, you become very sensitive to the, the greed and the, the violence uh, of power. And that never appealed to me. I did, I mean, when I was younger, I did sort of flirt with the idea in my head. It did, I did assume that that was the way to enact positive change. And of course, um, that's not true, is it? I mean, if we look at governments, uh, that is, if you want to do absolutely nothing, run for Pakistani government. You know, you'd, <laughs> it's, you know everyone wants to be a civil servant in Pakistan because you get paid and you do nothing. But... Sounds fair, fair enough. Sounds but writers, but writers and these activists and these community leaders are the ones that push for that change. They're the ones that break the silence. Um, and, and they're the ones that, at the end of the day, will save this country <laughs> from the politicians. So I would much prefer to be in that category than the other. <laughs> well, inevitably, this has turned into a political discussion rather than a discussion of liter <laughs> literature, which is what I think we were supposed to be talking about. Yeah. Um, but that's not my fault. That's, that's my fault. fault. That's that's we blame Soa. That's Soa. But, 
Is there anybody um, out there who would like to ask some, some sir, yes. Okay. <coughs> All that I want to ask you is, as an observer of the South Asian scene for many decades, mm. I continue to believe that India is a fragmented entity. It is many nations which uh, have not formalized their fragmentation. Many nations in a subcontinent, <coughs> which is huge. And the question has remained why India has not disintegrated. The question I humbly put to you is, I also see that Pakistan also mm. is a fragmented entity. Mm. There are many identities which mm -hmm. are against each other. Mm -hmm. And the question again is, why Pakistan has not disintegrated? I'm not talking of Bangladesh. Okay. I'm, I'm Aside from that then. No, no, no. I'm talking of West Pakistan. <coughs> And My question simply is this, and yes. I'm, I'm going to sum up. I'm yes, going to sum yes please. The glue which keeps Pakistan yeah. together yeah. is Islam, modernization, economic progress, or military power at the top. Huh. If you will give me some answer, sure? it will help me. <laughs> Gosh, I, I'd like some answers too, really. But... Um, well, I, you know, I think the idea of, of borders somehow containing everybody perfectly is, is an outdated one. Um, all, all countries, aren't they, uh, are now made up of multiple identities and, and are, are fragmented then by multiple ethnicities and identities. And I think that's true for anywhere, even Britain, uh, as it is for Pakistan or for India. Um, what holds Pakistan together? You know, well, I, I disagree that Islam holds it together. Because Islam didn't keep Bangladesh uh, together. Uh, you know, it didn't keep Pakistan within the fold of India, certainly. And, you know, India has the largest population of Muslims anywhere. Um, I think when we talk about Pakistan, we have to remember that this is a country only 63 years young. You know, at the time that uh, <laughs> the great Satan, the United States of America, was 63 years young, they were killing each other in a civil war and surviving on a whiskey tax. You know, I mean, I, I think... The progress that America made was not in its 63 years. You know, that came hundreds of years later. Well, not hundreds, hundred years later and some, and some decades. Um, I think we, we see countries, uh, on the other hand, like Iran, you know, that were progressive. I mean, thousands, hundreds of years ago, Iran was more progressive than perhaps it is now. Um, but, but Pakistan needs time, I think. I mean, certainly it's not a failed state, you know, it's not on the road to being a failed state. There are failed governments, um, and we've got a, a good amount of failed governments. But it's a country that's, that will survive. Um, and and these, these, these tremors, I think, we, ha we have to see as part of that, that road um, from Pakistan's infancy, which it's in now. Um, and that's a really roundabout way of answering a question, but that's I, a very good answer. I think it's a young country. Yes, yes. yes. Hi, uh, I, was going to ask you. I remember you. You were at King's Place. Yes. Yeah. I'm bad. Um, I just wanted to ask you how you deal with criticism because I've been reading a lot of reviews of book. Yeah. And in the West, it's pretty like you know they say nice stuff, but at, in Pakistan, there are people yeah. like Nadim Paracha and Aisha Zika and all these people yeah. who are coming out and saying, "Well, that's not the fact. That's not right." Yeah. <coughs> how do I deal with that? Well. Um, it's very easy when your critics are hysterical, I have to say. <laughs> um, and all the attacks that have come at me in the Pakistani press say, oh, this book is full of lies. Which ones? You know, this book is not researched. It has 15 pages of footnotes. But they don't talk about specifics. So it's very easy to dismiss them. And in fact, it, it's to be expected. Um, you know, I've been criticized uh, in my country for criticizing my grandfather. And there's, there is nothing disloyal about criticism. I've been criticized about defending my father and talking about his murder. It seems to be, an, it seems to be perfectly acceptable for the state of Pakistan to have killed Murtaza Bhutto. I should just stop talking about it. But the one thing they've never criticized me on is the corruption of Benazir and her husband. Nobody's brought that up. Nobody's brought the violence of the state up. Um, 
you know, but I'm too young, I'm too something, I'm too short, I'm too something else. So, you know, whatever. I, I, find it's, I find it's perfectly easy to ignore. On the other hand, you know, when I wrote for, I wrote a column for two years in Pakistan, my email address was public. And my rule was that I, at the time, not now, so don't email me, uh, that I would answer anything, so long, uh, even if it was critical, so long as it was engaging. So if somebody wrote to me and said, I totally disagree with you because I read this other book and it says da 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 da, um, I'm very happy to, uh, to, to discuss that. But when somebody writes to you and says, oh, I hate you because you're obviously a kafir and you <laughs> hate Islam and you don't cover your head, et cetera, et cetera, you tend to block those noises out. Yes. way. Yeah. Thank you. How do you view Jinnah and how do you think um, it would have been if there hadn't been Jinnah? Oh, well, <laughs> I, think, I think rather the question, if I can reformulate it, is what would have happened had Jinnah not died a year after partition? I think that would have produced a very different Pakistan, perhaps. But again, you know, it, it is a country born well, the region, it is a region really born in blood. You know, its independence was fought for. Um, we have generations of Pakistan who remember that. Um, then our, you know, Pakistan's independence, um, again, you know, the partition was the bloodiest, not just the bloodiest, but the largest migration movement in history. Um, the largest displacement of people at the time. All these are things that, are incredibly heavy, and again, not open for discussion in Pakistan. Um, but I think they need to be discussed. I mean, I have, there's certain things of Jinnah, you know, I admire very much the fact that he said at that time that this is a new country that will not, will not prohibit people based on their temples or based on their religions. You know, and that, that was cut out of his address when he gave it in those early days. Um, so certainly I admire Jinnah for statements like that and for decisions like that, which, which mustn't have been easy to do. But I also wonder, I mean, I also think it's important to ask questions like the fact that when Jinnah was around, Jinnah was the president of Pakistan, the head of the armed forces, the head of the Supreme Court, <coughs> the governor general, the supreme governor general, the provincial minister. You know, he, he was a lot of things at once. I think we have to talk about those precedents because we live with them till today. Yes, over there. A uh, related question about uh, the objectives resolution that, that happened in Pakistan in 1949, I think, that enshrined Islam as a guiding principle of, this, of the country. Uh, I, I wasn't quite going to go all the way to Qaeda Azam, but I was wondering about Liaquat Ali Khan and some of the associates of Jinnah. How did that come about so quickly? And do you see that really as a root of what followed afterwards, Ayub Khan coup and then the Islamization process that came much later? Or was that just an incidental event that could have not really affected Pakistan so much? Well, how it came about, I mean, I think what we know about Pakistan and India and Bangladesh and all these countries is, again, thanks to the cleavages left from hundreds of years of foreign occupation, is that your, the, your pool of decision makers is small. Um, in all these countries, you had to belong to a family or to one of two parties or graduate from one of two schools to be in a position to put forward resolutions like that. I mean, I think, um, which makes me wonder actually why we didn't have a constitution, a real constitution rather than something sort of cobbled together much sooner. It would have been easy to push through. Um, but the reason that Ayub Khan came in was because in something like seven years, I don't think it had to do with Islam at all. I think what it had to do with was the fact that in a seven-year period, we had 11 prime ministers. Uh, and all these 11 prime ministers were chucked out of office on, uh, guess what, grounds of you know, corruption and being politically incompetent. Um, and so when Ayub Khan came in, um, it was seen as a, a, um, a move for some sort of stability, and, and people took it. It was actually Ayub Khan's government that, that tried gingerly to suggest that Islamic be taken out of the title of the country, that it just be the Republic of Pakistan. And that didn't work. Um, but that said, you know, I think, is Pakistan an Islamic Republic, or what is an Islamic Republic, really? Um, I, certainly there are those who, want to, who think it fails as an Islamic Republic and want it to be made more Islamic. Uh, there are others, obviously, who want the opposite. 
But, you know, Pakistan is now an ally in the war on terror against our neighbors of Afghanistan and Iraq, two Muslim countries, two Muslim countries we've had long relationships with. So I wouldn't take our reputation as being hardly Islamic too seriously. Yes. Do you see the end to extrajudicial killings in Pakistan? Um, obviously, uh, we've got the drone killings now. Your father died yeah. in the 90s, tragically. Yeah. Um, how, what, how, where is the light at the end of the tunnel, if I, any? I'm so glad you asked that question, because unfortunately, no. Um, what we've seen, what we saw last summer in Swat, was uh, graves um, filled with people who had been murdered in extrajudicial killings. And the BBC reported, I think, that there had been some 60, 60 cases of, you know, incidents of, of extrajudicial murders being carried out in the month of August of, of 2009, it was. Um, in the last two years, we've seen a resurgence of extrajudicial killings in cities like Karachi and cities like Peshawar. Um, whether the police come into neighborhoods like Liari and kill wantonly, or whether it is other factions and political parties that do it, um, it the point is it continues. Um, unfortunately, nothing is being said about it, nothing is being done about it, because when drones are being carried out or when uh, people are being killed in SWAT, you know, 60 to a grave. We're told that they're terrorists. And you don't really defend the rights of terrorists. Um, when you talk about even the history of extrajudicial killings that we had in the 90s, especially in Karachi, we're told, again, they were criminals. But the fact is, if they're criminals or they're terrorists, arrest them and take them to the courts. You know, you don't, you don't kill people on the road. We ha we've developed now in Pakistan... A, 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 Actually, you know, South Asians are so good with language, I think. But we've, we've come up now with a new way of talking about extrajudicial killings in all across South Asia. They're not extrajudicial murders. They are police encounters. Uh, like, like you have an encounter at a coffee shop, you know, when, when you meet an old friend. Um, and, and I think a great problem is that when we talk about, again, media and human rights groups in Pakistan, they're not talking about it. I mean, what are they talking about? I don't know what they're talking about anymore. But extrajudicial killings is not one of them. And unfortunately, every time uh, one of those killings is, happens, um, it opens the floodgates for many more. I think probably we've got time for um, one, more, one more question. I'm sorry, no? there seem to be a lot of people here. I'm going to ask the lady at the back. <coughs> I hope this will be a positive question to end with, actually. <laughs> okay. um, earlier you said you see yourself as one of thousands in Pakistan in terms of those who are speaking out. And I mm -hmm. go to Pakistan very regularly. Okay. And I also feel that there are individual voices that I yep. hear. But do you see any collective movements in Pakistan gi that give you hope for the future? Ah, oh, collective movements. Um, <coughs> you know, th it's tricky to talk about collective movements because everyone talks about this idea of civil society and did they come out with the lawyers' movement. But... Not really, because they were just people who spoke English. <laughs> you know, they weren't, the rest of the country doesn't speak English and has to work every day so they can't go and protest for the next seven months. Um, but but I, suppose, I suppose they are, but they're informal movements, aren't they? They disappeared that I was talking about. I mean, there was a movement that came around these, these men and women um, who were relatives or colleagues of the people who had been disappeared. And I, I remember when I, when I was in Balochistan, when I was in Quetta, I visited a family of one man who has since, by the way, released. The police admitted they had him. The army admitted they had him. Because of the noise around his disappearance. And he had his nieces and all the children of the neighborhood would go every Tuesday or something like that to the press club with his photograph and chant. You know, I mean, the children, is that a movement? But it certainly put a pressure. And, you know, and, and three months after his disappearance, the police, who at that point had been denying that he was in their custody and had been proclaiming that he was a jihadi, admitted that he was in their custody. And another four months after that, he was released. So those are movements, but they're informal. You know, women's groups, certainly. There are informal women's groups um, that do make some noise every now and again. You know, Muhtar Mai and, and her speaking out about um, rape and, and crimes against women has, has, has resulted in a sort of informal movement coming up around her. But I, I think... I think it's not worrying that they're informal. I think there's something positive to the fact that they're informal. They haven't yet been taken over as sort of personal vehicles for something. I hope that answers the question. Well, look, um, it's good to end on a, on, a, on a message of hope, and let's 
Let's hope there is hope, yes. Let's yeah. hope there is hope. And I, and I have to say, Paul, we've, we've got to do the reverse of this next time. We have to bring Mike back to Soaz <laughs> after your next Shakespeare film is done. Right. And then I get to grill you. <laughs> deal? Yeah. There are witnesses here. Absolute deal. Legal contracts are binding. A an absolute deal. <laughs> King Lear, which I'm doing with Al Pacino, is actually the story of a dysfunctional family. Well, there, and so, I, who better, <laughs> who better than me to talk to you about that, Mike? Who better? Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. She's a wonderful talker, as you know, and she's also a fantastic writer. It's, uh, it's, it's an amazing book. I think it's number one in India, isn't it? it has and, been for, and Pakistan. And Pakistan oh, as well. Yes. There you are. It's the yeah. Samistat version in Pakistan. <laughs> Um, but um, she's, um, and uh, as you can see um, from, from one of the last of the Bhutos, you can see what the bloodline has led to and how this, this uh, very powerful and charismatic family have continued to hold Pakistan in its spell, at least the, the hopes and dreams of the people of that very wonderful country. And I have to say it is a wonderful country. Um, I went to Karachi uh, recently, and, and um, it's, it, despite all the problems that are there, there's one thing that absolutely hits you. It's that there's a life and a joy, mm -hmm. the, the kind of life and joy that you find all over Southeast Asia, actually. Yeah. And it's not absent in Pakistan. And with that, I think, more than anything else, you can feel a sense of hope. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <laughs>